be actually really listening to the class and then later some point you may be searching here and there those people the not people really doing well job okay not for those guys uh, there is still couple of people actually not up to this class okay so those people are going to be in trouble as we going forward do not place any youtube link due to any reason unless if i provide that link okay all right so anybody have any question those things please reach out and ask then i can explain uh, what's going on all right right hand side you will see a couple of options uh, i can change the object type but technically you know uh, there is no effect of the object mass or the shape with the gravity gravity is constant for everything to test that out you can just simply use a random object with random velocity fire that and then find out where it located right that's the place leave it that uh, that path you can see the blue color path that leave it there go into right hand side change the object let's put a human there mass and shape is completely different click the fire button right here on the bottom red button you can see he goes exactly the same path because the initial velocity is zero initial angle zero size of the shape size or shape of the object doesn't matter then you can put a piano fire that it's gonna go exactly on the same path and then you can put a car fire that this is nothing to do with the lamp by just showing you the the gravity is actually same for every object okay only force of gravity is a different scenario now you know that in newtonian mechanics but the gravity itself is actually same for every so because of that let's do a cannonball that should be okay and the size and shape just leave it as it is it doesn't matter really what the object is okay all right then let's do the first part of the object i need to get rid of this path in blue color click on this erase button bottom yellow icon then click on this positive sign on the object right here which firing the object and then click and up drag click and drag upward direction then you can bring the uh, the position to about like 15 meter above the ground then click on this edge of the gun right here and then drag downward direction until you see angle zero if i arrange that then i can have this situation which i would like to simulate i have object initially moving horizontally with velocity zero okay and that's all it's very simple let's go a little bit lower velocity maybe about 14 is good enough initial velocity size and shape doesn't matter the don't change the gravity at all we like to represent the earth gravitational field 9.81 uh, make sure air resistance does not apply if air resistance apply everything changes okay we assume all our projectile correction air resistance is zero even though in real life there is a little bit but it's almost negligible in most scenarios that's all really i want to study v0 and which mean i want to measure vertical height versus horizontal x so let's do that so i have a vertical height in meters horizontal x in meters and the starting point is 15 negative because now this is a zero point we go in negative direction y axis 15 negative click the fire button and you can see the path in blue rid of this you can bring this sensor in the very top which is on blue color and then click and drag all the way to the where the object drop into the ground then you can measure the range 24.48 and it, it shows you the time to keep eye on that time because since i am sending the object horizontally and the height is same velocity keeping the same technically if i uh, change the height 
If I keep the height the same object moving there, this time of flight going to be the same. If I slowly change in the height, you can see time of flight going to be affected by that. Okay. So keep eye on that and then let's continue. Click and then drag downward direction one meters. You can erase the path actually. We don't need it any longer by clicking the eraser button here. Keep the same initial velocity, horizontal angle zero. And after it's done, bring it and then measure. Now you can see time of the projectile decreases, range decreases accordingly, right? So that's what we expecting. Minus 23.65 and uh, sorry, minus 14 height and then range 23.65. And likewise, let's continue. Question? Anybody have any questions? Okay, then let's continue. This is exactly how we do in this lab in class. Also, we're gonna do, we have a toy gun. We're gonna take a stand. It can't go 14 or 15 meters high, right? That's only different. We're gonna go only like maybe, 20 30 centimeters above the ground and then decreasing slowly maybe like five centimeters at a time so maybe about at least half a meters and then decreasing 10 centimeters at a time that's what we do in class but in the simulator this height is much larger that's the only difference and also the initial velocity we can't get this high initial velocity it's going to be about like two meter per second roughly something like that very small that's all, then decrease this to 13 meters and then erase the path of the projectile, fire it again and then measure the range. So now I'm on minus 13, range is 22.79. And decrease the projectile to next position, negative 12, erase the path fire it and now i'm negative 12 new range is 21.9 question erase the path then decrease by another one meter fire the projectile Measure the range 20.97. Now I'm at negative 11. Range is 20.97. And likewise, you just continue. Erase the path. Decrease this by another one meter. Fire the projectile. And then measure it. Now I'm on negative 10. And we are on now 19.99. And then let's continue, erase the path, decrease downward one more meters, fire it. And then let's measure, now I'm on minus nine. So the range is 18.96, 18.96. Then next position on vertical is negative eight. Range is 1788, negative 8, 1788. I add these two decimal places for y-axis purposely. You can see and the simulator does not give you so, that much accuracy. But uh, since the range have the two decimal accuracy, let's assume uh, we can measure the vertical also with the same accuracy. Okay. Erase the path, next position seven meters in height, and the range is 16.72, negative seven, 16.72. Erase the path, then next position is negative six. We may need three more data points. 15.48. Fifteen dot four eight. Next position in vertical height negative five. Fourteen meters 
negative 5 14 meters exactly 14 yeah no 14 1 3 Okay, next last data point about four meters above the ground. Twelve dot six four negative four. Twelve dot six four. And you may need one uh, because today's experiment we do in three different dimensionally, three different type of. It's the same uh, simulator, but three different type of uh, processes we're going to study. Because of that, I would suggest take at least three different uh, pictures, okay? Screenshots. First one is this one. Second one we're going to do in a bit. And the third one going to be different than the first two. Because of that, make sure you're taking three different simulator pictures. And also, uh, those must go to the procedure section, one after the other. And then in the procedure section, you have to have this link, okay? That link, do not put it into the reference section. That's why you have a lab manual. Lab manual has this data. You don't need to put that separately. You refer lab manual directly, okay? But in the procedure section, you have to tell where that the simulator is, exact location, okay? All right. Question. Okay, so let's continue. So what we're going to do in table number one, so let's calculate. So we need to calculate initial velocity. Now you know the equation, right? Earlier we discussed. Initial velocity equation going to be range times square root g over 2y. So let's do that. Equal sign uh, range is actually this cell. Click on the cell value C10, multiply by square root SQRT, parentheses, uh, G divided by 2Y, right? So that was the equation, G divided by 2Y. G is minus 9.81, divide by parentheses, two times Y is this cell. Close brackets for that red color, close bracket for black color, that's the square root, hit enter. If my measurement is correct, I should get the number which actually already provided in the simulator. You can see we actually provided in the simulator 14 meter per second by getting exactly the same answer, right? So that's the idea. So if you do everything correctly, you should get that same answer. Since I already know that I can compare if this is an in-class setting, then we don't actually know that number at all. We're just going to rely on what we're going to observe here, direct calculated value. Because of that, any error, if this is in-class ex uh, experiment, if any error happening here, going to be a disaster for the next two uh, part of the lab because those two part depending on this calculated uh, value. So oh, that's the that's the only uh, important part if it is in class setting, but the simulator it doesn't those things doesn't matter. You will get the perfect answers. Uh, that's the advantage. Okay, question. No questions. Let's then click and write. That will give you the perfect answers. Oh, I know what happened. I have to change this very quickly. Why uh, it does that? It should be only this part be 10. Okay, let's click and drag. Perfect answers is still. My measurement is too perfect. Okay, let's give one more decimal place to see whether there's any sort of error. 
answer is too perfect i don't like that we have to have some error actually that's what i'm checking okay let's give a little bit of error let's see yeah if you give actually a little bit of uh, more a uh, few more extra decimal places you can see actually number is changing okay i would suggest let's keep like maybe three decimal places because i would like to see that slightly different right otherwise it looked like two perfect answers that's very unlikely in a real life situation right you can see what happening is it rounding if you do only two decimal places it's rounding into 14 all of these numbers uh, to avoid that scenario let's uh, do three uh, decimal places okay one extra it's a calculated value technically we're supposed to have more decimal places there so let's have it couple of more question you know how to reformat right click on the cell where you want to reformat right click format cells and then increase number of decimal places to whatever the number you need in this case i'm gonna leave three decimal places click ok and then go back to the same cell right hand side very lower green solid dot click and drag downward it will do the calculation for rest of the cell by keeping the same amount of significant figures now I'm keeping one significant figure more than what it's supposed to be. Don't keep it many, many. Like still I see very few of you uh, doing that. Uh, whatever the number you get automatically, maybe five or six significant figures, you show all of those significant figure values on the Excel sheet. That may not be a good idea. Question. okay now if this is in class setting then there is a problem like by calculating this directly yeah i know the value but there are going to be a problem because i'm not sure really whether that's the right number right i calculated but i'm not really sure whether that's the right answer because of that if it is in class setting uh, what we're going to do we're going to actually re-estimate this number uh, by using graphical methods so that's what we trying to do next so the same v0 i want to recalculate by using the graphical method which means by making a graph by using the graphical method right so if i want to do that i have to make a graph so how am i going to make the graph anybody know what should i do Insert graph in Excel using uh, Table One data. No, before, yeah, line. yeah, that's true. But before that, you have to know what you are planning on graphing. So, what are you going to graph? So, if you want to calculate something, you have to identify what are the variables are. You have to have a two variable, right? So that means both axes. You have to have a x axis. You have to have a y axis. You need to first identify them. Now, I have equation. By using equation, let's try to identify that. One side is square root. I want to calculate this parameter. Only two variables which are measuring here actually y displacement and the range x, right? So which means I have to separate out those. You can first square this both side of the equation. V0 square is equal x to the power 2 g divided by 2 times y. It's very difficult sometime uh, I'm writing on the Excel. So sometimes you do a lot of different things. Let's see whether I can go back. Excel is not good uh, for the writing purposes at all. Let's see now it should be fine, I think. Okay, so let's continue now. What I want to do is that bring this equation and then it's square both side. V0 is square is equal x is square g over 2y. Then rearrange, keep the y on your left hand side, bring everything onto the right hand side, right? So, and then this is going to be g divided by, 
still not good. Let me write it down this again. It's going to be then g divided by 2y. Keep the y on left side, bring everything else into the other side. d divided by 2v0 to the power 2 times x to the power 2. Now that's the equation. Step number 1 identify the equation. Then you can see this is your y axis, this is your x axis. If you put x square into your x axis, if you put y displacement onto y axis, you will get a data set should be look like, I think it should be look like opposite. See, it's not letting me to erase either. Excel is not good for writing at all, right? That's okay. Writing down somewhere here, something wrong. Maybe my Excel responding is very low. You will get maybe a, a graph look like that with the negative slope. This is going to be now x to the power 2. This is going to be now y. If I get the slope of the graph, that slope of the graph should be g divided by 2 v0 to the power 2. Then I can find the v0 is equal g over twice the slope of the graph is square root. g is negative, slope of the graph is negative, negative cancels out, then I can find the v0. So why we do that, if this is an in-class experiment, then actually I don't know whether this calculated value is exactly accurate or not. That's why actually we do that if this is a class experiment, but the simulator actually confirmed the accuracy is good, but let's do that. So that's the idea, okay? So that's the analysis part. You have to carefully look at it. That's what we call the data analysis and modeling. Can you model something if you don't know the theory part? That's the idea of the physics classes. So that's the connection. If you're thinking or wondering why we're doing these classes up to this level, uh, if you want to think about what engineers do in the, in the field, they actually collecting data, understanding the data by using different modeling. You can't just blindly search an equation and then blindly just graph anything. That's not the way. You have to look at the problem first, identify what's supposed to be a graph, then address the problem. So now I need the y versus x to the power 2. Let's make this square first, right? x axis power is equal sign, cell number C10, power is hat, shift and number 6, 2, right? Power 2 and then click and drag. Okay, then we have x square and then make sure you fill up the units and everything. Still like very few have those mistakes. Sometimes unit is missing. Sometimes uh, the formatting is very bad actually. When you copy this and paste into Word file, you have to revisit that, that, that page, right? Make sure the formatting is nicely organized there. Uh, Sometimes I see very bad formatting things like that. Those are simple things you can easily uh, correct it. I don't know why some people don't care those things. I just uh, mentioning anyway. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, then let's make a graph. So how to make the graph? Then let's insert a graph sheet first, right? There's a couple of different ways, but I would actually prefer this method. Insert, then in the middle, you will see a chart area. Click the chart, scatter plot. Okay, scatter plot, and then double click on the graph. Then you can insert the data, left hand, right hand side, very top, the icon. Then this new window will appear. Add, click on the add, new selection tool appear to select the X and Y data. Click on the place X. And in this case, X should be X square value. So that means D cell number 10 through D cell number 21. Click on the first cell. 
uh, on your left hand side keep clicking and then dragging from the right hand side right uh, uh, right hand finger okay on the touchpad <clears throat> then on the y values uh, delete everything there y values is starting from the b cell number 10 through b cell number 21 click okay click okay again then you have a graph If you have a graph, make sure you have to have a graph title, right? We have to have a graph title. What happened? Yeah, okay, good. Erase everything there. So due to some reason, my Excel sheet is very unresponsive. I think uh, I just quickly need to close down it and then reopen. It's very delay after I type anything. It taking few seconds to do that. It's very not normal. Let me close it down and then open, reopen it again to see whether it can be solved. Okay, one minute. Due to some reason, it's uh, working very slow speed. Maybe my computer actually has to restart. Hopefully, it's worked now. Let's see how it goes. Otherwise, I have to restart the computer, I think. Okay, let's check now. Okay, now seems to be fine. Okay, if you have a graph, make sure you have a graph name. Um, this is what this is, Y displacement. Graph name, you can't name this way, okay? Some people are still naming this way, Y versus X square. That's bad. That's actually very bad, okay? Graph name is not that. You have to really type the name. What's the name mean? This is Y displacement. You have to type that name. Y displacement versus uh, X or the range score. You can say range score. That's fine. It should be a proper name, okay? Not just uh, variable, really. That looks really bad. There's no huge, huge point reduction for those things, but it's still I see some of those uh, mistakes on some of you, not, not everyone. Very few now have those issues with the labs. Okay, now just double click on the graph sheet and then left hand side, very top, you can add the axis title, right? Chart element, axis title, horizontal, axis title, vertical, and then I have a linear graph. I need the trend line as usual, and the trend line should be linear. And make sure you name the axis title properly. This is the range, but it's square of the range. Unit should be meter power two. And then if you have a y axis, you have to name it, not just y there. You have to say y displacement, not just the displacement either, okay? You have to say what displacement. That's a y displacement, and then you need meters. Now you have a nice graph. And if you have a trend line, of course, the equation should be shown up, right? Bring this uh, arrow, uh, bring the mouse, uh, the cursor on top of the trend line, double click. Then on the right hand side, new window will appear. Then click on all these three. All of those three should be clicked. Then you will see a equation will appear that equation will show you a slope and also it will show you r square r square shows you how perfect your data set is right so if r square is one that means the fitting is perfect fitting perfect mean it shows you about your data too our data set is perfect because these are calculated data actually inside the simulator right what does simulator does it calculate internally so it's a calculated data technically we recalculating again so that's why it's perfect data set if you do in class 
this number right here and the next number we're going to calculate from the slope going to be actually slightly different because this will give you the average value. That's the idea. Question. If you have a graph, make sure you're renaming as a figure, right? This is going to be uh, roughly about fourth figure. The reason is that you have to have a three uh, simulator pictures on your procedure section, okay? At least three simulator pictures on your procedure section. If this is figure four, then you can say this is a graph of Y displacement versus range is called. Range is score and then let's continue and then make sure you adjust and then format everything before copy paste into the copy paste into your report okay still i see some of the mistake that's why i'm telling it again and again and the pictures also you can collect as we progress uh, there should be one picture already so that's our first simulator picture I will leave it here just for reference purposes. Then you know how many pictures we expected here. You can do different way to get these pictures. Okay, snipping tool or whatever the way you like doesn't matter. I just take the screenshot as a regular. And if you, there are some more information, make sure you crop that out. Click on the crop, black arrow, and then get rid of anything unnecessary and then show nicely only this simulator part that's all we need in this case okay and this will be our figure number one actually so figure one this should be names particularly some of the uh, some of the student is still not naming uh, carefully this thing uh, those are good practice for you if you do that practice that's going to be sustained for you it's not going to go away after the class okay that's some of the information which will be very useful. So this is a schematic diagram. You can't just name it like this is a figure one measuring displacement versus or time or anything. This is a schematic diagram, schematic picture, or you can say schematic diagram of the simulator for part one of the experiment. That's how you're gonna name it properly if you want to name it, okay? You can say part A of the experiment you have to name it you have to come up with some nice way of explaining the graph not just some random name okay what that picture means very precisely okay question okay then let's continue let's do table number two Average from the table number one, calculated average. You know how to do average equal sign A, B. Select the average function, then select the data range starting from E number 10 through E number 21. So this number usually gonna be perfect. Let's keep a couple of decimal places extra. Otherwise it's gonna show you 14.0 exactly, okay? Now let's compare that to the expected value. We given is the expected value. Expected value, you can write it down or included here. V given for the expected value is 14.0 meter per second. That is the number we apply to the simulator, okay? And a b uh, parent uh, equal sign a b s do the percentage error parentheses expected 14 minus calculated cell number c29 close brackets 14 multiplied by 100 oops i have a small mistake there there should be a division sign there okay let me copy paste those function and then make sure all these functions you collect it and then add them at the very end of the lab report that is the appendix c okay most people now doing it 
uh, but not everybody. So this is the cal function and then this is the PE function. Okay, question. Okay, now in, in this lab report, when we when we're calling about usually we consider two different things in the lab report, significant figures and the measured accuracy, right? Now you can see I'm breaking both rules when it comes to this number. Uh, I'm not given into the given accuracy and the significant figure to the reason I want to see it a little bit off the value than the perfect number, right? If I round it into two decimal places, it will give you 14. I don't like that number because then it look like very perfect, okay? So that's why I keep it like that. That's okay to keep it like that in this case, okay? So we try to understand more uh, than what it actually providing us. Question. Then let's calculate be calculated by using the graph. So what's the equation? Equation we referring earlier, we talk about that what formula we referring right here. So formula we studying is actually this, right? You have a X range, which is equal to Y times G, uh, sorry. Let's write it down that X range which is equal what V0 times T and then downward direction I have Y equals 0 half times G T to the power 2 T is equal 2 times Y divided by G square root so which means technically V0 which is equal X divided by T but that t is going to go here like this way. But I can rewrite that g goes to the numerator divided by 2y times cx. Square both side, then you will get y is equal g divided by 2 v0 to the power 2 x to the power 2. That's the slope. Okay. So that's the equation we need. So let's calculate that. So now you know equation should be g over 2 v0 squared g over 2 v0 square must be the slope of the graph. So which means v0 should be equal g divided by 2 times the slope. Slope is negative, g is negative, cancels out, square root. So let's do that calculation, equal sign, square root, sqrt, parentheses, g is minus 9.81 divide by parentheses twice slope of the graph minus 0 to 5 minus 0 to 5 close parentheses for red color you can look at the parentheses colors if you're not familiar with this function then it will tell you how many parentheses needed okay other side uh, professor, isn't the slope 0 0.025? Yeah, 0 0.025, correct. So that's why that number is actually not 14. Yeah. Then you will see number is about 14.0071. So let's keep that decimal places, otherwise you will see it even not meaningful doing the percentage. There it's going to give you a perfect answer, right? Let me copy paste that function to this is for v cal but from the graph okay and likewise you can collect all of these functions uh, as you progress in the calculation question Okay, then 
let's do the percentage error it's going to be very small but since i done previously for cell number d29 i can actually click and drag that will do the calculation automatically that's the advantage of the advantage of using excel right you can minimize the amount of time you are spending for recalculating the same thing again and again in the table that has no any real meaning for in the in this uh, this era okay so we are not in 1950s so that's why i'm always telling you that uh, try to minimize the use of calculator during the lab or completely avoid using use of calculator during the lab class it's not really give you any advantage or anything for your future at all but the calculator use also important because in the exam you have to use it right so still you can't get rid of completely but uh, in the lab class i would suggest to get rid of that fully okay any question This lab is very straightforward and fairly very uh, easy calculation. It's not really anything serious. So we completed the first part. We can start the part B, table number three. Okay, since there seems to be no question, let's continue to table number three then. Now we're going to check the projectile in terms of different uh, type of projectile. In this case, we're going to send the projectile from the ground level with initial angle theta, initial velocity V0. Then you know this component. This should be V0 cosine theta. This should be V0 of sine theta. So now you know all of this information, right? This goes up and then drag down to the ground because of the gravity. It will reach the maximum height at some point. At maximum point, upward velocity is zero, but horizontal velocity remains the same V0x component, right? That's the V0x component. This is the V0y component. Now, what we're going to do in this lab, V0, we know, right? Now, we know that's a 14. We're going to keep it, right, as it is. Theta, we can measure. If this is a real-life experiment, we can actually measure theta by using a protractor. Uh, that uh, toy gun, which I mentioned you earlier, which we're going to use this, uh, this experiment in class setting, has a protractor attached. So, as far as you actually change this angle right here, you can actually directly measure the angle like you're observing here. It's a very simple experiment. Let's bring this all the way to the ground level. When you bring the ground level, lowest possible angle you can go is 25, okay? We can't go anything lower than that. And now what we're going to do, we can erase the path of the projectile earlier. Let's keep the same velocity because that's how it's going to be happening if it is in class lab. And let's shoot this object by keeping the same velocity. You can see it dropped right here. And then in if it is in class setting, only thing you can measure is actually you can measure directly this range. That's the only information you can measure. You can actually measure that directly because we can pinpoint where the object dropped if it is in class setting, then we're gonna measure that X. So the range we know, right? So the plan of this experiment actually by measuring the range, can we actually measure, for example, recalculate the gravitational acceleration to test out all the projectile uh, information we discuss in the class is correct or not. That's the plan. Now, how we do that, we're gonna measure range of the projectile motion we know v0 that information we know from the previous and angle we know which mean actually we know these two component by knowing that how can i calculate gravitational acceleration what we do anybody know what we should do there
think. So where you start the process? So that's how you're going to start thinking, right? So I want to go here, but I don't know how to reach there. But I know some information, right? You start from where you know. So that's how always the case for every single problem. So the problem may be very new. Maybe you can't really see the solution method first. That's totally okay. Then you start thinking where it's given and then how, whatever you know, you start from there. I know the range, right? I know the range equation. Range equation going to be what? V0x times the t. That's the range equation, right? I know that, which means I know this, I know this, I can actually calculate the time, for example. Time is actually easily calculated, x divided by v0x, and then v0x is v0 times the cosine t. That can be done. On the other hand, I know initial velocity y component, and the same time I can estimate by using the y-axis. If you look at the y-axis, and then if you apply, let's say I'm going to apply delta y is equal v0 yt plus half gt to the power 2 for y-axis for the complete motion, right? A to B to C. I'm applying this to A to C. If you apply that to A to C, G is there. That's the one I would like to find. Time from A to C, I already know. That's the A to C motion, right? That I already know. This I already know. V0, Y, I already know because V0 and the sine theta I already know. And what about the delta Y? I don't know that, but delta Y is you go positive direction Y up, negative direction Y down. If you add total, displacement going to be zero from A to Y. On Y axis, there is no displacement at all. Okay, you go up, come back. So this is going to be then V zero Y times T plus half G T to the power two. One of the T cancels out because T never going to be zero. I can divide that easily. Then you can find the T easily by using this equation. Bring the V0Y to this side. This is going to be negative V0Y times 2 divided by G. Friction. And the V0Y, on the other hand, you already know. And the T is already you know. You can combine these two equations to get the information what we're looking into. Let's write it down. So the what we need to calculate is the G. So I know the time two equation now. X divided by V0 cosine theta. And also T is equal minus 2 times V0 Y divided by G. Now you just rearrange this one. Bring the G into one side. Bring everything else into the other side. That's all really. It's going to be negative 2. V0Y is V0 of sine theta. Then I have sine theta cosine theta divided by x. This information I can write this way minus V0 to the power 2. Twice sine theta cosine theta is actually sine 2 theta, right? Divide by x. That is the gravitational constant. So that's the idea. If our theory, which we are doing so far in chapter number three, four, and then beyond, are correct, then by measuring just x, right? That's the only measurement I'm going to do from here. Theta is known, v0 is known. We're going to estimate the g. If this is correct, then I should get 9.81. Since this is a simulated result, you will get perfect result. But if you do this in class, you will get a little bit of four, like within 5 percentage error should be fine. Question. Any question so far? Okay, then let's go to table number three. That's the plan, right? You can see that equation here already given for you. 
and then I can calculate the T also because I'm not expecting just to do this uh, numerically. I actually expecting to do this part also graphically. Okay, that's why I need those calculations. Now the angle must be measured in degrees. You can insert the degree sign, insert, and that should be inside the symbols. If you go into there, and if you recently use that gonna be here, but if not, you have to look on here, okay? Maybe Latin supplemental extended, uh, you have to check there, you can find this degree sign, okay? And X is measured in unit meters, and time gonna be measured in unit second, G gonna be measured in unit meter per second square, right? Meter per second square, that's it. Then uh, in terms of experiment, all we need is the uh, measured values for the range, that's all, right? So this is the range, friction. Okay, then let's continue. Let's measure this. Let's start from 25. We already have it, but you can recheck that. Make sure height, this should be zero, okay, right here. Uh, and uh, velocity should be 14. Make sure those are fixed. Don't need to change anything here in the object shape and everything. Even you change, that not has any effect to this experiment. You know that and all we need to do fire the object and then bring the sensor and then measure it so the one of the the problem i think i use in this sensor that will give you very accurate reading uh, to read it accurately you have to be careful when you bring the sensor this cross sign exactly going to the ball drop location when it's go there you see inside that cross sign the ball will be highlighted in white background that's exact location, then the numbers will show up on the sensor, right? So what we could do earlier, actually we could use this, um, this one to measure that. This is actually not a sensor, this is a regular tape meter. So that is what exactly we using if it is an in-class experiment, right? Let's use a tape and then see whether I can measure accurately. See now it 15.29. This number is 15.31. See the difference, right? So if I use the tape, I'm gonna be getting a little bit of off reading than, than the sensor value, right? I would suggest let's use the tape, otherwise, our calculated results are gonna be too perfect, like on the previous table. May not be anything much interesting then. There's no error. In the physics experiment, interest is gone. Uh, we're not expecting two perfect results at all okay, in any physics experiment. Part of the game is actually studying the error, how much error can happen uh, in an experiment, right? Let's measure the tape, really. Instead of the sensor, it's too much accurate. So my number is 15.29 meters, okay? 15.29. So I'm using now tape, okay? Tape has a one cross sign one side. Keep it on the positive sign of this, uh, of this place right here, where the object is firing. And in the other positive side, you can actually click and drag anywhere you wanted to measure, right? So that goes to the ball drop location. Then you can measure the length on X axis. That is the range, okay? So in my case, I'm reading it to about like 15.29. You have to bring and put it this exactly to middle of the ball, okay? If you do it second time, you're not gonna get the previous answer. You can slightly change, but you can recheck that. As close as possible to the ball location. You can zoom this in actually if you want to. To see a little bit clearly now, if I zoom this in, you can see I'm not measuring to the right location, right? See that? Zooming in. So 
So let's click and drag this little bit. Should go a little bit further, maybe actually about like 15.37. Bring the sensor to make sure. 3137, that's okay. Let's uh, read the 1537 value. I would like to have some error after we calculate the G instead of very perfect result, okay? That's it, then we continue by changing the angle. We have done 25 degree angle, let's do 30. Erase the path of the projectile. Click and change the angle to 30. Each five degree we moving, okay? Fire it. Show it again. Maybe 17.32. That's good. 17.32. Erase the part of the projectile, change the angle to 35. Let's show it again. I'm rechecking to make sure number is close by. 1877, 1884, that's okay. Let's read little bit of error. 1884. Change the angle, erase the path to 40 degrees. You can see now slowly it increasing, right? Now I'm on 40 degrees. Now it is 1968. Let's make sure that yeah, that number should be perfect. 1968. And erase the path. Go into 45. Fire it again. Okay, now the number is about 1998, I'm measuring into 2001. Let's use that number, 2001. Measure by using the, uh, uh, the tape meter instead of the sensor, okay? But you can check with the sensor to make sure it's a reasonable value within the margin of error, okay? Now you can see one important thing, okay? Now keep track on this. Now I'm on 45 degree angle, okay? Now we're gonna go into 50. I would suggest take a picture here, a screenshot, and keep that track, okay? Don't erase that. Change the angle into 50, and then fire again. Now you can see new location is less than the previous. So which means when you go from uh, 25 degrees to 45, you saw that the range is slowly increases, increases and increases up to a certain point. But after 45 degree now, you see it is starting to decrease now slowly. So which means the maximum range I can get is about 45 degree theta, right? So that should be theoretically validated, right? So to do that, what you have to do, go into your equation, range equation. Now this is the range equation, right? You remember this equation earlier. In the chapter, x is equal minus v0 squared divided by g times the sine 2 theta. Okay, g is negative. This part is going to be a constant. Now you can see x is technically directly proportional to sine of 2 theta, right? Now x is going to be maximized whenever the theta maximizes, right? So what's the theta range? Theta is varies from 0 to 90 degrees technically. But however, since I have a 2 here, sine maximum going to be sine 0 is 0. If I consider sine of 2 theta, theta variation going to be 0 to 45. Because by the time 45, you have a sine 90 here. Sine 0 is 0. Sine 2 times 45 is 90. That is actually 1. So the sine maximums you're going to get exactly at 45 degree angle. So that's what this equation tells you. That's the theoretical expectation for the maximum range. So if you doing the football or the kicking or the punting, then you know you have to have a right angle to send it to the really far distances. 
that the angle. If you have the 45 degree from the ground level, you can send the ball to the furthest possible location. If anything lower, anything higher, it's difficult. So that's why you can see it actually a difficult job. It's not a simple job like you kicking the ball. Instead, you have to have a really good idea about what really happening and then how to arrange those things, how to change the, the, the way you punt and then so on. It's not really simple like we think. Okay, let's continue. Now you see it's decreases slightly. Let me show that. Any question? Yeah, about there. Let's check that number 19.68. I'm on 1974. That's okay, I think. Let's read that number 19.74. Slightly off. That's okay to have a little bit of error. Okay, now that's kind of measurement. If you're doing this in class, it's very difficult to see that, that, that difference. You can see within five degree range, the amount of difference is going to be not much. It's actually a very small change. Uh, those are the error if we measure in this in class setting. Okay. Now let's change into 55. Five degree angle. Keep the keep the part to make sure actually decreasing. Okay. See that? Now it's going backward direction. That's the idea of maximum angle. Okay. Measure it by using the tape meter. 1877, 1884. Let's take the little bit of error value, 1884. Oh, that match match perfectly with the 35. So you see that. Okay, then let's continue. Keep the part to make sure actually that decreasing. Okay, then 60 degree, fire it again. Okay, it actually decreasing. Measure that, make sure the sensor value also same. Good, 1738. And let's measure two more data points, 65. Keep the path. Okay. Fifteen three one. Fifteen three two. Let's take that number. Fifteen three two. And the last data point seventy. Fire it again. Okay. So measure that again. 12.9, 12.84, good. So 12.90. Now, the what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a picture actually here. That looks nice because you have that range variation, all the parts. So I can take the screenshot actually here. So that is screenshot you have to input for this uh, this part of the lab. Okay, and also you can try actually increasing more. Let's go to 80 to see what's going to happen. Okay, let's go to 80. See that what's really happening here as you increase in the angle, you can see what's really happening. Ball goes upward direction more, right? You can see the maximum height. Maximum height is increasing more and more. So that makes sense. If you want to send the ball further and further up, what you need is actually much, much higher angle, right? Because it should be close to the y axis. If you go 85, you will see it go, go much further, right? What will happen if you go 90? Go 90 all the way. Go up directly, come back itself. That's the vertical motion, chapter number three, part number B. So that's where we started discussing vertical straight motion, right? So immediately after you angle that, then you can see it becomes the parabola. You can take a screenshot also. And we have a data set. We just need to do the calculation. Question. Anybody have any question? Okay, so let's go to the calculation then. Let's insert that picture also. I'm going to collect all the pictures one after the other here. Okay, now this is the second one. I have to have a picture there. 
of my second case. Okay, I'm gonna use the picture with that lot of uh, projectile paths. So that shows you the nice behavior. Get rid of anything unnecessary there, crop the picture that out. And leave it like that. Yeah, that's good. And that's our picture number two. So these should go into your. These should all of these should go into your procedure section. Okay, this is actually figure number two on the procedure. So that's going to be a semantic diagram of the simulator for part B of the experiment. You have to name it properly, or you can write it down the uh, projectile sending from the ground. So that's the part B of the experiment. Previous part is instead of part one, you can send, so you can write it down horizontal projectile motion because the object sent above the ground, but horizontally initial velocity. Okay. All right, question. Okay, then let's calculate this time is delta x of v0. So we can easily do that equal sign. Delta x is actually the range. I already have it here. Divide parentheses. v0 x component is actually v0. I'm going to use this average value instead of 14, right? I'm going to use 13.99. 13.99 average value multiplied by the angle. I need cosine, right? However, when you do the angle uh, for the Excel, Excel needed everything in radian. So I have to use the radian function. Radians, angle is 25. Close brackets, close brackets again. Enter. Let's see what's wrong there. I think I have extra bracket probably there. No, I need one more bracket there actually. Okay. That's the time. So that time you can actually check, I, I forgot to mention earlier, the time actually you can check after we go into 70 degree, that path is, is still there. Let's check the time with the simulator, okay? Let me copy paste that function. So this is TCAL. Okay, and then let's, do the rest of the calculation for other angles. You can just go into the same cell, D number 39, click the right hand side, very bottom corner, solid green dot, downward direction. Now let's see one of this angle. Do you remember the 70 degree location? Let's do 70 degree anyway, again. It already there, but it's okay. Don't erase any of the path. Let's resend the 70 degree to identify that. All right, so let's measure that. So the time of the uh, time of the flight is about 2.68, right? So let's check that. Time of the flight 2.68. I'm going. I'm getting in my calculation 2.70. So we good because we have a little bit of error here in this uh, measured x. You can see I'm using 12.9 from my tape meter measurement. However, the real value in the sensor is 2.84, 12.84. So that's the little bit of error there. Otherwise, we are good. So if I rounded into the first decimal place, we have the correct answer. Okay, question. Okay, so everything is now good. We tested the numbers from the simulator too. Let's continue. Uh, let's take a quick break here actually, 4.32. And we'll start in 10 minutes, okay? Ask any question if you have about anything. Okay, so let's continue. Any question so far? Okay, any question? 
All right, so let's continue then. Now, earlier we tested the time of the flight, right? So look like time of the flight is good. So let's calculate the gravity and then see what number we getting, right? We expecting 9.81. Let's do that calculation, equal sign, minus V0 to the power two, negative sign, then V0 is about, 13.99 I'm going to use, okay, average calculated parentheses, 13.99 to the power 2, close brackets, and then multiply by sine, I need twice theta, sine, parentheses, we need the radian function always, right, radians, 2 times theta, that is B cell number 39, close bracket for radian, close bracket for sine, and then divide everything by delta X, right? That is C number 39. Then hit enter, I'm getting 9.75. That's good. We have a little bit of error. So that the error, because actually you remember, I purposely measure delta X little bit wrongly. Because I could use the sensor. If I use the sensor, the number is going to be too perfect. So instead, I use the meter uh, or the tape meter. Because of that, I have a little bit of error. That's totally fine. So the GCAL, that's what we're going to get if you're doing this in class. You're not even getting this close. Sometimes you're going to get 9.5 or maybe 10.0, 10.1 numbers like that. Within like 5% or 10% error margin. That's the function I'm using for GCAL. Click on the same cell, E number 39, right hand side, very bottom, and then drag downward direction. So we are rounding this for two significant figures, right? So we leave it like that because we're going to compare with the 9.81, but we can actually use at least about one more decimal place one more decimal place comparing uh, to the measured accuracy of the range, right? So let's do that actually. Let's use one more decimal place since it is calculated values, highlight whole range, right click, number, and then use one more decimal place to see how much the variations are. So I'm not even anything close to the 9.81, right? See that everything is 9.75, 7.8, 7.6, 7.9, and then so on. I have a little bit of error there. That's totally fine. Because if you do this in class, we will get such a number. We're not going to get very perfect close to 9.81. OK, and any question? Let's do percentage error, equal sign, ABS, we expecting 9 point negative, 9.81, minus, we calculated this cell, E39, close brackets, divide by ABS, parentheses, minus 9.81, close brackets, multiply by 100. Error is not, not bad at all, okay? So we are close to about like 9.75 or so. We expecting 9.81. Error is within about one percentage. That is still very good. So this is going to be the PE calculation for table number three. Question. Any question? All right, so let's take a look the same thing. Uh, now, earlier I mentioned that if we calculate something in class, most of the time we would like to check that graphically too, since we have a data set, right? Let's take a look how to calculate this graphically, right? Now, this is the equation, right? This is the equation. So let's rearrange this equation a little bit x is equal negative v0 to the power 2 divided by g times the sine of theta, sine of 2 theta actually. 
So which means if I can make a graph a range versus sine of 2 theta, putting this into y axis, putting this into x axis, that graph will be linear. This is going to be sine of 2 theta. This is going to be the x or the range. So the data is going to be look like this. And then if you fit that data for the trend line, slope of that trend line should be actually this part right here. This part right here. By using that, actually, I can re-estimate the gravity, right? So the slope of this graph is going to be equal minus V0 squared divided by G. So from there, I can find the G, which is equal minus V0 divided by slope of the graph. And that's the graphical method, right? So let's do that graphical method. Any questions so far? All of these are actually answers which are asking under each table, okay? You have to be careful. Every table under that, there is a, uh, several questions. So what we're doing is actually answering those questions, okay? Now we are right here. So I want to make a graph delta x versus sine to theta. Question. To do that, I need the sine 2 data, right? Let's make new column right here. So let's make sine 2 data here. Sine 2 times, I think I can copy, paste the data from there, or I can in, import the data, insert symbols, insert the data symbols there. Okay, sine 2 data, let's calculate that. Equal sine, sine, Parentheses, I need the radian function, radians, two times the theta. And then close brackets, close brackets again. And then that is the function, this is the function I'm using for the sine to theta. Okay, let me copy paste that function also into here. Sine two times theta equal that function. Those are all the function for table number three, okay. Click and drag right hand side, solid green dot, then I have the sine to theta and then you can make this formatting a little bit. All the lines, borders should be visible. And then to do that, then you can reformat everything properly, okay. That one you have to do yourself. That column wasn't there, okay. Now I can easily identify this part going to be missing if somebody is not listening and then doing some other random uh, video following to make the report, then that person going to get zero for this lab. So very simple trick, right? All right, so let's continue. So let's do that kind of trick every lab, then I can, I can make sure whoever is supposed to get zero getting zero for the class, okay? All right, so any correction? Okay, so let's continue. Now let's make that graph. So insert, uh, usually the scatter plot, right? Insert scatter plot, double click, left and right hand side, very top, select data. <clears throat> let's select the data. Let's select the data. Click on add and x values and x values are the range cell number uh, x value should be actually sine to theta sorry that should be cell number g39 through g48 and y values should be the x that should be the range starting from c39 through c48 click ok click ok again you should see this nice graph right here and then you're going to see only about like five data points right five data point the reason why you see actually five data points uh,
Okay, the, the reason why you see actually five data points, the reason you can see data points are increasing to one because you know we're working on the sine two theta. So when you, when you reach actually 45, you already reach a sine max. Then you go in again the backward direction, right? So these data points are actually going top of each other. Otherwise, there's all together four, five, another five, ten data points, but you see only about five. Reason the other five is top of each other, okay? And that's it. Then you type the title for the graph. This is actually what sine two theta versus sine two times theta versus range. And I need uh, X and Y titles. So those are usually double click on the graph, left hand side, very top, axis title, horizontal, and then vertical and also if I have a linear graph I would like to have a trend line linear fitting so now you can see x axis this should be sine to data you can copy paste actually this part if you want to that's okay okay sine to data uh, and this should be the range this should be unit meters. Then we have everything there. If I have a line, then we would like to have an equation visible, right? So bring the cursor on top of the fitted line, the trend line, double click, right hand side, very top. Then you will see the trend line options. Let's select all of these three. Then I have equation visible right so that's what we're looking into because we need that and also you have to name this this should be now figure five right um, figure five this is graph of uh, sine two theta versus range okay correction All right, so let's calculate then table number four. Now we have everything with what we needed, but we need a couple of uh, information there. Uh, G calculated average from the table three. So since we have many numbers calculated again and again for same parameter, you know the usual practice now, uh, you have to get the average, right? So let's do the average here. Equal sign AB and then average command. And then cell should be from E39 through E48. Okay. Close brackets. That's the average command. Let me copy paste that also right here. Then you can collect all of those as we progress. It should be G Cal average. Oh, that's the command I need. G cal A V G. That's the command I need. Okay. All right. Correction. Let's do percentage error also for that. Equal sign A B S parentheses expecting minus 9.81 minus calculated average. It should be equal sign. Calculated average C55, close brackets, divide by ABS, parentheses, minus 9.81, close brackets, multiply by 100. So we are very close. That, that error we observing because we actually purposely made that error. Okay, otherwise, we're going to get the perfect result. And uh, let's continue. Any questions so far? So this is the other command. Only different type of command you need to actually put it into the appendix C. You don't need to repeat the same command again and again. Okay. So every different command for every table, collect it and then put it into appendix C as a separate page. Then you can call them in the discussion instead of rewriting all those commands. You can uh, use it uh, easily. Any question?
All right, now let's take a look how to calculate the GCAL from the slope of the graph. Now I have the slope of the graph. Now earlier in our equation, we discussed that slope of the graph should be V0 squared divided by G. G calculated from the graph should be negative V0 squared divided by the slope. So that should be the GCAL. Let's do that calculation. Negative V0 squared divided by the G. So equal sign minus V0 is 13.99 power 2 divide by slope of the graph 20.031. 20.031. So I'm getting perfect result like I get the average here. So that's what we're supposed to expect because if you have a many data points, if you calculate something, get the average of that that same average represented by the graph. That's the whole idea of actually doing graph. So we don't need to really do this average again and again, because if we do the graphical method, that itself enough that actually show you average behavior of your data set. So that's actually what we're observing right here. Question. And that is why earlier I mentioned that uh, if we had an error in our initial velocity, first table, then everything is going to be wrong, right? So if we're doing this in class, most critical information is going to be the initial velocity. That we don't know. We have to really rely on the first data set. If we do that correctly, then our lab is good. If we didn't do that correctly, the whole lab is going to be very bad results at the end. So this is going to be G from the graph. That's G cal from the graph. Question. Percentage error you can do easily by just click and drag right hand side very bottom corner in the cell number D55 because you if you do it once if you click and drag that will do the rest but you have to be careful uh, because when you click and drag, if you're not reading properly, that might give you a very wrong answer. Oh, I know what's happening here. So I have to have a negative sign properly here. That's why. Okay, so put the negative one here inside parentheses. Okay, otherwise that negative one may not be reading properly. Okay? You have to correct that. Uh, previous uh, function right here when you write that function make sure you have parentheses minus one close brackets multiply then it will read it properly if the negative sign didn't read it properly this will come as a positive number 9.77 if that is the case you will get a really huge percentage error reason is we comparing to the negative 9.81 okay question Okay, now let's take a look a uh, couple of other questions which the lab is asking. Then this last part uh, for table number table number two, this part is actually for table number two here, but table number three on our data sheet. So it's asking to figure out the data responsible for the maximum range from the graphical method, right? Now let's take a look how to do that. We know data we expecting it to be uh 45 degree angle right so which means if i make a graph right let's say if i make a graph look like this you earlier saw this right uh, let's say i put a theta here and then range here then this graph gonna be range gonna be slowly increasing as the theta increase from zero to about like 45 degrees, right? At 45 degree theta becomes, the range becomes max and then slowly starting to decrease back. So the other data point should be look like this. So I will get a parabolic shape, right? So that's the idea. Now, if I make this fit with the parabolic fitting, with the parabolic fitting, 
or you can say y to the x to the power 2 or the polynomial fitting, polynomial second order fitting, then that polynomial second order is going to be a x square plus b x plus c. Okay, this can be a, b, and c can be positive or negative depending on the shape of the graph. So if I have a polynomial function, then you know how to get the maximum, right? In your calculus one class, you probably already, uh, pre-calculus class actually, you probably came across those things. But we're not going to do all of those. You can take a look later. We can use the function minus b over 2a. So I just need to identify what is b, what is a. By knowing that, actually right here, you can see that number function if you want to check it later. By knowing a and b, I can actually calculate what should be the theta max responsible to get the maximum range. So I can experimentally identify this location that we call theta max. That's the position of theta responsible to get the range maximum. Maximum range, okay? That's the plan. So to do that, you have to make that graph first. Question. That's what actually right here we do in answer for this question, okay? This part. All this part, answer for those, all that part, we're going to just do it on the table, okay? So let's make that graph then first. I need the graph of, let's make it here. Insert on the menu and then the chart, the scatter chart. And I would like to have a graph which should be double click on the data sheet, select data. And then I need to have add x should be just the theta. So that's going to be b cell number 39 through 48. And then y value should be the range that c cell number 39 through 48. Click OK. Click OK again. If the graph is correct, then you should see parabolic shape downward. Now you can see how much uh, study you can do by just simple experiment, right? This is an extremely simple experiment. We could do even within like one hour, just the basics, but that's not really our interest. We are not interested in just collecting data and then go away, okay? That's not our interest at all. So our interest is, is actually go deep into that data and then see what actually we can understand by just manipulating the data, okay? Let's rename this title. This is going to be now what uh, angle or you can say theta versus range. And I need uh, chart elements, left hand side to very top, axis title, horizontal axis title, vertical. And then trend line, you have to go more option. If the more option is not visible, that's okay. Just click anything, okay? It doesn't matter. Click on the linear. I can actually change that later, okay? Just leave it there. Then this is going to be theta. This is in degrees, right? You can actually put the degree sign or write the degrees, but that must be there because that's a unit, right? And the y axis is going to be now the range. Range is in meters. Now this uh, trend line, it's not supposed to be a linear, right? Let's change that. Bring the cursor on top of the trend line, double click, and then uh, click on the polynomial because we're expecting it to be second order polynomial. Usually, program will automatically select the best fit. So it says you order two. That's what we're expecting, second order polynomial. Go all the way here, click on the R score and the display equation. So that too should be visible. Then ABC you can see right here. And this is the A number in front of X. B is number in front of number in front of X square is the A. Number in front of X is the B. Number after that is actually the C. Okay. That's what we discussed earlier. It should be fit with the second order polynomial. If it correctly fit, I should be able to see A, B, and C. By knowing A, B, I should be able to calculate 
what's the maximum uh, angle which is responsible for the maximum range. So now this is going to be our figure number six. Question. Let's name it here, our figure number six. Figure number six, this is going to be theta versus range. You can write it down more details if you want to for projectiles in from the ground. In from the ground. Okay, correction. Now let's calculate theta angle responsible for the uh, for the maximum range, right? So which is equal now. Parentheses minus sign B divide by minus sign B is another negative. Put this way negative sign parentheses B is minus point zero one one five divide by parentheses two times. Sorry, B is actually positive one point zero. 361 and then divide by 2 times parentheses minus 0 0.0115. That's from the graph directly, okay? So you need to identify ABC with your polynomial fitting and then extract that numbers and then you have to do the calculation for the theta max. If you do that correctly, then you should be expecting number to be about. 45 degrees. You may not get the 45 at all, but about 45. As far as we're getting about 45, then we good. Question. Professor, can you click on that equation again, please? Sure, let me copy paste that into here as usual. Uh, this is going to be the theta max, okay. Okay, so that is the equation for theta max. Okay, then let's continue. Anybody have any other question? And to do the uh, absolute, uh, do the percentage error for that, <clears throat> we have to compare that with the uh, expected value 45, right? Let's do that too. Um, and also you can see these calculated values. I did not put the unit here because units are different. You have to put the unit on this, right? So let's add the units. Uh, these two have a unit of meter per second is squared. And this also meter per second is squared. But this one is actually unit should be degrees okay you can add the degree sign or you can put the write the degree uh, term that okay for that i think that should be degrees okay oops i know what happened there i need to put it there after here that's why okay degrees if you can't add the sign just uh, just type it in in name that's okay All right, so that unit you have to add yourself. Okay, I did not add that because uh, we can't add the same unit for all of those because this table has a, a couple of different things uh, in the same table. Usually we don't have that way in the table. Okay, I just set up that way. It is easy for me when I grade it really. That's why otherwise this information go well everywhere. Now you have to follow exactly what we do here. If not, there are going to be huge point reduction. Even you do it correctly another way, I don't care. I need, because I spend three hours to explain this. If that is not in the report, that bad luck for those people, okay? I'm going to give huge point reductions. So which means either not listening to the class or don't care what we do in the class, okay? Either way, 
uh, we can't really do anything about it, but that's what it is. So you will get the consequences, okay? All right, so we'll do the percentage error equals sign ABS parentheses 45 minus calculated D is 45.05 divide by we expecting 45 multiplied by 100. So we are very close by, okay? Question. All right, so then let's continue. Last part, we can finish this in about few, maybe 15 minutes or so. We can have a little bit more time extra. So that's that time we can use to do one question from previous chapter. Because Professor, can you, show the, can you show the function again for the angle oh, max? Yeah, the angle max may have function right here. Theta max, okay. And let me copy paste this uh, ABS function that's different. Uh, let me put it here, okay. Sorry, also for the percent error. Yeah, that's what I'm doing here. This is for PE theta. PE for theta max. No. Okay, so that's the function for that. Okay. All right, any other question? Sorry, sir, can you click on the percentage error? That's the, um, I think you put the same one, the, the theta max. This is theta max, D cell number 57. Oh, you were asking, I put the same uh, same command. Oh, yeah. I think I did not copy that. Let's see. Yep. Let's copy that here. Okay, now it's good. Okay, so collect all the command and then add everything into appendix C, okay? So you have about like five different command here. Previous table had about four and then so on. So if you do that way, your amount of time you have to spend for the lab gonna be minimizing that way instead of you have to retype everything, calculation and everything in our usual method. If you do this with the calculator, you have to show that calculation. So that's gonna take a lot of time. Instead, you spend the whole time for the lab and then collect all this information in one Excel sheet, then that's it, you sit down and then put it everything into your Word file. So that's fairly straightforward and easy. Question, I know it's still it's gonna take some time, but if you get enough practice, uh, then it's gonna be uh, getting easier as the semester progress. The next, after this lab, I think, uh, amount of work for each lab gonna get reduced by a lot second half of the semester. Any questions so far? Everybody okay with that table? Then let's continue to next table, table number five, the last part, okay? All right, so the last part, what we're gonna do now, we study in three different type of projectile here, right? That's what exactly we're gonna be doing if it is in class A. Uh, we will study first uh, sending the object from the high ground to figure out the velocity of that uh, uh, that toy gun, a spring gun, and then we're gonna send from the ground level and then try to analyze that with the equation to see whether we can get the G correctly. And then let's do the another version of this uh, projectile. Let's bring this little bit above, maybe about three meters. And then let's send a little bit angle. The, let's send the projectile now about like 10 degrees. Now you know, you can actually analyze this whole thing, right? This whole uh, projectile by using the projectile equation. Let's take a look at that first. If I analyzing that, that will be still useful. If I analyzing that part, now the projectile is sending a little bit above the ground. Above the ground right here. 
with V0 and then angle going to be theta. This direction I have V0 X cosine theta. Upward direction you have V0 Y of sine theta. This go up and then go down and then hit the ground at some point, right? So this height will say we know, right? H. Now this is let's say point A, this is point C. Now the experimentally I can only calculate this. Uh, I can measure X, right? So what we're trying to do is actually by using measurable, experimentally measurable parameters, we can measure H, we can measure X directly. We know theta, it measurable, and then V0, we already know. That's the speed of the projectile launcher, right? So by knowing those information, let's see, I want to calculate again G, right? So let's see if I can do that. And then if I get the G correctly, which means our analysis is correct. So that's the idea. And let's uh, do this calculation. Now you know the, the method now, right? So the what method we need? Now I need to do G, which means I don't know how to do that. Now I'm going to go back and revisit the problem. I can calculate x, which means range x is equal v0 x times the t. I know v0, I know x, I can calculate the t. t is equal x over v0 x or x divided by v0 cosine theta. I know the time of the projectile, total time, okay, from A to C. By knowing that, what you can do now, I can now take a look. Idea is to calculate G, right? G is on the Y axis. Let's take a look at the Y axis now. If I look at the Y axis, then you can see let's apply delta Y is equal V0 T plus half G T square. Reason why I'm applying that, I know the initial velocity Y component. I know the time already here. And then I know the total displacement from A to C, and I need to find the G. Everything is there. That's why I picked that equation. Okay. Let's apply delta Y going to be minus the H, right? Which is equal V0 is upward direction positive. V0 is V0 times the sine theta. V0 times the sine theta times the time I already know. Let's plug that later plus half g t to the power 2. Now from there I can actually recalculate g, right? Let's calculate gravity. Keep that and then bring everything into the other side. Minus h minus v0 sine theta times t parentheses multiply by 2 divide by t to the power 2. That's the gravity. So I can actually use this information, which I measure indirectly, only I need actual initial velocity theta, h, and then range, and the, and the angle theta, and then initial velocity. And then I can calculate the gravity. If our theory is correct, we should get a good answer for that. So that's the plan. Question. Okay, let's check that out then. So all we need is actually a couple of data points. We're not going to make any graph or anything because this equation is a little bit of uh, too much to work with in terms of graphical situation. You can see I can't easily separate out two variables to make a graph. That is possible technically, but it's uh, really not easy to do like the previous case. But we can do that if you want to, but it's okay. So let's do only calculation uh, by using equation, okay? So let's do uh, table number, last table, okay? Table number five, 10 degree angle, starting 10 degree angle, uh, angle is measured from degrees. Degree sign you can bring from the, I think table number two, I inserted that, yep. You can bring that into here if you want to. Degree sign is going to be range in unit meters, calculated times in unit second, and calculated G must be on unit 
meter per second is quant and then percentage error okay 10 degree make sure initial height is 3 meters technically you can do any height doesn't matter but the reasonably low height is okay and then let's fire this okay then let's measure the displacement we're going to measure by using the tape meter instead of the sensor then make sure you recheck with the sensor to make sure that's accurate right 14.78 14.78 and then uh, keep that that path and then let's continue with the degrees then we can identify what's really happening to the range okay then increase the angle to 20 we're going to go 10 by 10 in this case okay initially 20 fire it you can see the range increases measure it bring the sensor and recheck that 1855 oh that's perfect 18.55 and then increase the angle to next degree uh, 30 yep 30 fire it keep the part don't erase it then we can see how it varies actually and measure it is still increasing let's check that 2149 2150 2150 let's use the tape meter value okay then it asking you to go five by five let's go each five then 35 okay slightly higher make sure you recheck that 22 37 39 that's close by 22 399 i'm going to use tape meter values and then increase the angle to 40 40 fire it again slightly off right now you can see we may be closing into the maximum range right you remember that earlier it was 45 that's why you see that strange behavior there initially it's going to be too much of a variation now it is very small 2278 22.78 and then 45 45 now you can see things are changes right if you remember earlier 45 was the maximum and then after that it should be decreasing but now you can see 45 is not the maximum 45 is actually just drop before the previous this is 40 that is 45 you can see it's slightly off okay it's not too much off but it's very slightly off that's the 45 and then that is the 40 so the 45 is about like 2263 40 is about 2277 so which means maximum may be in between 40 and 45 it may be slightly less because the, now the formula is completely changes that 45 is valid only if you actually sending from the ground level okay now let's measure that it's very difficult to actually measure with the tape meter but let's try as much as possible to read it correctly let's check that 22.6364 22.64 keep the path Let's change the angle to 50 and then resend that. Now you can see it decrease more and more. So that now for sure, after 45, definitely not going to be the maximum point. However, the, the now the maximum angle may not be 45. It, it's going to be very close to that. We could check that actually by drawing again another graph right let's do that also we have enough time so i'm going to erase this all the parts because it's difficult to read now what's the right one to measure so that 50 degree measure it now this is about 2204 
2204 then the 60 degrees now it's getting much much lower now it's about 1894 18.94 for observation you can check maybe 70 or 80 then you can see how much it decreases right that's 72 and then if you go maybe 79 you can see now getting much much closer okay so the maximum is close to maybe somewhere somewhere 45 or maybe by looking at the data set i can see that is maybe a little bit lower than 45 let's calculate that too okay all right now let's finish this the table first correction okay so let's do this uh, time first right time is the range of v0 x equal sign range c66 divide by parentheses v0 is 13.99 multiply by cosine but you know angle must be with the radian function always in the excel okay radian function click on the 10 close bracket for radian close bracket for cosine close bracket for denominator then you will get the time you can check that timer this is 10 i don't have actually 10 degree angle here i can check that quickly if i fire the projectile from 10 degree angle we can check that quickly yeah 1.07 we are, our calculation is perfect there, those are the advantages actually if we working with the simulator we have this freedom of going and checking to make sure the numbers are make sense or the correct or not otherwise if it is in class setting always we have to compare either existing data set or we have to make sense of the numbers really you can't have here very very large time because this is stay on the on the uh, very small amount of time period okay and that function, let me copy paste here. This is the tcal. tcal function goes here. Okay, so that's the tcal function for table number five. Correction. Let's continue this table, then you click back on the same cell, D number 66, click and drag, then you can calculate the time. You can see as uh, the angle increases, the, the projectile stay on the air, is actually increases. However, the range decreases, right? Because it go more and more higher in the Y axis. So that's the idea. Okay, then let's calculate gravity equal sign two times parentheses minus y in this case y is three right you remember three meters above the ground minus three minus sign parentheses v0 of y v0 is 13.99 multiply by t calculated cell number d66 close brackets close brackets again divide by D calculated power 2, D66 power 2, and then hit enter. Not getting the right answer. Let's see why happened. No, I know what happened because I have to have V0 of sine theta. So V0 times sine of parentheses radian function times the theta. Theta is cell number B66 close brackets multiply sign one one parenthesis is missing let's see what missing here so one parenthesis is missing okay so let me copy paste that function so this is the function for g cal okay
All right. So now you can see we are we are, our numbers are very close to 9.81. The reason is this is a simulated result. Otherwise, in real experiment in the in class setting, we never gonna get this close. Very rarely, okay. Very rarely we got some numbers, but in general it's gonna be five percentage or so error in, in general. If it is within two percentage, that's a really good error for in class plan. Question. And only other other side effect, other side result actually from these calculations. Now you can see the projectile study we're doing under the assumption of the air friction has no any effect. Technically, it's true. It's uh, at low level, very close to the ground level. Then if you do this kind of very quick study, um, air friction is actually not much effective at all. It may be slightly effective. That may be the one reason for this error. But if I good, uh, if I get the numbers from the sensors, I will get perfect result always. Okay, it's going to be very less error, uh, very less effect of the uh, resistance. That's why sometimes we do the calculation without it. Question. Then let's click and drag E number sixty six. Then we have all the data. If I have many calculation usually we would like to do average equal sign a v g average function select the data range e66 through e73 so i have the average 9.78 okay and then let's do the percentage error then let's do this function also all the different type of function for each table you have to collect this is for G, Cal, AVG, Cal average function. Okay, now let's do percentage error equal ABS parentheses negative 9.81 minus calculated gravity. Divide by ABS parentheses negative 9.81 close brackets multiplied by 100. So now we are within the about like 0.5 or maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.5 maximum is about like 0.6 percentage of error. So when you do the discussion, you can add, right? So we still even with the simulated result, we get in the little bit of error, right? Then you have to discuss what type of uh, reasons for this error, even with the simulator. One is effect of air resistance, of course, a little bit there. And the other one is that our measurement error, we purposely use in the tape meter uh, to approximate the value. We're not using the sensor, right? There's a little bit of error there. That's the two major errors we actually observing here, okay? Question. Okay, let's, uh, anybody have any question? Um, professor, I'm getting a weird percentage error. Then you have to check the function. Then you have something wrong in the function. Your G values are fine. Calculated G values are okay. If you look up fine, then check this function, okay? Oh, okay, I got it. Okay, anyone else has any problem? Different numbers, different things on your table? First check the numbers for that calculated value. If that makes sense, numbers are good. Then the if you're using the same number, then it's gonna be the error in the command. Okay, so I think we done everything asking for this lab. Let's do one quick check, okay? Then we can do a one question from our last chapter. So let's do one quick check. That is actually the, uh, you know, this is actually sending a little bit above the ground also. You need actually a one picture, right? So let's take that. 
for this one. Print is screen. I'm going to add that also after the last two pictures right here maybe. Then all of those must go to your procedure section. Okay. Yes, last one. Drop that out. Anything unnecessary. And then you have three nice pictures. And this should be now figure number three because this should be on your procedure section. That's going to be first few numbers for figures. This is for part C. Okay, three pictures and then how many tables we had. Now figure four, five, six, all of those are, are graphs you need. And then let's check, let's check one graph very quickly because we can actually estimate the maximum possible uh, angle for to take the maximum possible range if I draw the same kind of graph like this one, right? Let's check that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just copy paste this graph instead of making from scratch. Click on the graph, copy, and then paste that graph here. It's up to you. You don't need to do it necessarily, but uh, that is easy because the formatting is going to be same in the graph. Then double click on the graph, edit the data. Now remove the series. Don't remove the series actually. Click on the series and then click edit. Then bring that here all the way to the last table and then delete everything there on the x axis and then define new x. A new x should be new data range of data from B cell number 66 to B cell number 73. And the new range should be table number 5, cell number C66 to cell number C73. Click OK, click OK again. Now you should see these two graphs are not the same. See that? Graphs are different now. You can see max is actually shifted a little bit below the 45. So this is where the 45 is. Now you can see max is slightly below. I can find the max actually by using these numbers right in front of the equation. Let's do that calculation too. So this is now figure number seven. Figure number seven, this is the theta versus range for projectile sent from h distance above the ground, h height above the ground, okay. It's calculated that uh, theta max, theta max, okay, let's do that calculation, equal sign minus parentheses b over 2a, right, b is 7 point, no, point 7153, point 7153 divided by parentheses 2 times A is point 0 0.0089 close brackets, close brackets twice. Now you can see the maximum I'm getting from that equation is about 40.185. That's what we have seen from the data too. It very close to 40. You can see that the range is maximized close to 40, not 45. Now, which means if you are a punter in the football team, if you are punting when the punting from the other end, uh, when the game is starting or uh, after scoring or things like that, then you have to punt from the ground. Then the angle should be 45. But if you are punting in between that, anywhere to get the maximum range, angle should be slightly lower than, right? So those are really useful information, uh, depending on which uh, which place you actually study them. Okay, this is actually the function I'm using for this. Okay, that should change a little bit. Okay, now it's good. Uh, okay, any question?
Okay, that's the function I use there. Okay, that is a little bit. Okay, now you can see it clearly. Okay, any question? Potato max. So this is actually not required part for the lab. Uh, but if you want, since we've done it, uh, I would suggest just to include that at the very end, uh, the data for the last table. And uh, that's better. But if you don't include it, it's not a big deal. There's no point reduction for that. That's extra part we done, okay? All right, so we done everything for this lab. We have about, yeah, we have about 19 minutes. So we should do one correction from the previous chapter. Uh, that's what we're going to do as the semester progress, okay? Because the labs from, I think, this point and then moving forward going to be shorter. We can be able, we should be able to finish the rest of the semester labs maybe within a uh,